Welcome to Barbell Logic. Rewind. You're listening to Barbell Logic. This is Matt Reynolds. I'm here with my compadre, Scott Hambrick. Hey. And one of my close friends, Brett McKay. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So, Brett, now you're an upper management of the cult. Now right? I'm an upper management. <laughs> we jumped him in. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, no. So yeah, I did the podcast and then a few months later, 2015, I asked like, Hey, let's do some videos. So I was doing YouTube heavily back then. I don't do it anymore with the site. And I filmed how to squat and yep. my low bar squat sucked. Uh, it was terrible. No, I don't know about that. No, like the wrists were terrible. I, I couldn't know, everybody get yells about the wrists. Yeah. Everyone is yelling about It's fine. We did deadlift and then I went back and then shoulder press. And then I went back a few months later to do bench press and power clean. Yeah. Yeah. And then after that, I was like, I'm going to start doing this. So I started doing the, the programming, the you know, linear progression, novice. Uh, but I had to stop because like, on the low bar squat, I would just because my setup was terrible, I would get really bad bicep tendonitis. Yeah. And it was so bad that I couldn't deadlift. Like I couldn't like I'd get done mm. with squatting. like my biceps just they're they're hurting. Is this normal? I don't know. I guess so. And I would just fight through it. And it got to the point I can't I can't even pull anymore. So I'd take a break and then I'd get back to it. And then finally it happened again. I was like, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore. And that's when I got, that's when you reached out to me. Yeah. And you're just like, hey, you know. Matt. I was just in an email. That yeah, was you like, just hey, an email. Thanks for the videos that you made. Right. I'm doing online coaching. It's like, I use your videos all the time. The right. same videos we're talking about. Yeah. I was just like, thanks for what you've done. It's cool. And, yeah. And, and, and you I, said, hey, can you help me with my bicep tonight? Right. Exactly. I said, hey, you know, I like this, but I asked you, like, do you offer online coaching? Because like, I think it'd be great if, because I don't have a coach to look at my form. I couldn't get that in Tulsa. And you're like, oh, well, actually, I do offer online coaching. And you should ask. And uh, Which is we, really not the reason that I emailed, although I was super excited when you were the one that reached out and said, I remember sitting at the dining room table and, and telling Rachel, telling my wife, like, I think Brett McKay just asked me to online coach him. She's like, who? <laughs> right. But <laughs> who's yeah, this it's guy? fine. <laughs> right. Um, and that's we started working together. So that was what? Like, November 15. November 2015. Yeah. We started working together. And, and my favorite gosh. thing about that is that little skinny guy that is in those videos was not yeah. the guy that's sitting at the table I weighed, right now. Yeah, the first videos I did, I was 185 or 180-ish. And then I went back four months later because I'd started eating better. And I got up to 200. I was like, I weigh 200 pounds now. But then when I got on with you, that's when it really started picking up. Sure. Because uh, you started doing the nutrition. What did he tell you should weigh? What, him? Well, yeah, yeah. I don't, you've, you haven't really been like giving me any targets. No. You're, you're like... I think at one point, you're like, if you want to like pull, I need to weigh 245 if I want to pull 600 or something. Yeah, like I that. remember saying stuff like that. I mean, for me, the the diet drives the progress. You look, yeah, you look like an insect. You look like a praying mantis. And so, uh, and so for me, it was always about you've got to eat enough to drive the gains. And so from the very beginning, we put you on linear progression. Your, linear, your actual linear progression wasn't very long because you had done a lot of it already. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I wasn't like completely new to barbell training. Cause I think I remember when I posted that video of me doing a uh, bench press, five reps of 225. Sure. People yeah. were like, oh my gosh, like Brent's like a newbie and he's like doing this. Like, no, I had like, I barbell trained all through high school sure. doing, you know, right. whatever programming the strength and conditioning coach gave you sure. at the time. And then I did barbell training on and off since then. So I mean, I was a novice still because I had a linear progression in me, but I did have some training in me. Yeah, of course. Which helped speed things along. Because, yeah, how long was I on linear progression once it's I started? Probably two months with me, yeah. I think. So by the time we got into January of, of 16, we started to put you on intermediate-based programming. So, so more of a Texas method. And, and we put you on a – I remember for a while you actually did a four-day split on three days a week, which I'm not crazy about. But at the time, I remember you were having – like it was really busy art of manliness. Right. And it was, and so we're like, I can only get in three days a week. So we basically just alternated upper, lower, upper, lower. Why don't you like the four day, four day and three? Because I don't think it tends to give enough stress to drive adaptation. It's at least not with a guy that's, that's Brett's age. So you get somebody right. in their mid thirties, early thirties, you know, on the week that it's two lower body sessions and one upper body session, I think it's fine. But on right. that next week where it's two upper body sessions and one lower, it just doesn't seem to be enough total stress. And so when I've done that, and I still have a few clients that do that on the week that where like the Wednesday workout is the lower body workout, I hammer them. So they're doing at least two sets of five on deadlift, if not three sets of five mm -hmm. on deadlift, because it's just one session that week. And so they're not going to have to do another lower body session until Monday of the following week. So you're talking about a five day layoff. That's what you're doing to me. Well, just hammering me. Well, yeah, but yeah. you've got advanced programming now, Sorry. so you have to get hammered. That's, that's the deal. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So let's stay on the body weight thing for a second. So we drove your body weight up to about where, 
You remember like your at, high point? At the meet, the high point was like 227, 228. Okay. That was the meet. And I, you know, I, one of the things that's been just kind of a joy with working with you is that really from the beginning, I mean, you ask questions, but you've, <laughs> you've relinquished control and you trusted me in my, in my right. programming. I mean, I, I told you when I, I mean, I wanted so badly to deadlift 500 pounds because I had been chasing that before you for such a long time. Sure. And I'd got up to like 465 on my own and then I plateaued. And then yep. I started like, okay, I'm going to find these like special deadlift programs where you do like back extensions. Like it was like yeah. weird stuff and it didn't budge. And then when mm -hmm. you came on, I got on with you. I said, I will do whatever you tell me to do. I want to deadlift 500 yeah. pounds. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I feel like I have, like, I mean, I, I'll ask questions. I'm curious. Yeah, of course. No, you no, yeah. very well. It's not like, because like, like, this is dumb. Like, why are you having me do that? Yeah, I'm sure you and, get some of that. When and I, I know, like, I know it's probably even like, I don't, we actually don't get a lot of that. They just don't do it. Like uh, you program it. Yeah. Just it's don't do less it. argumentative. Although, I mean, we, you know, we get some, but, but I'm just so curious. It, the other piece of this is, let's I certainly don't say this to make you uncomfortable in any way, but as, <laughs> as you get these people who are, who have a big following online, Mm -hmm. They tend to not do a great job of following the program, right? It's not even that they are argumentative. They're often not, you know, I think they're busy. They've got this big following. They're doing all this other stuff. And so the program or the linear progression is not that important. And for you, it's funny. You've really kind of adhered to the program with consistency as well or better than just about every client yeah. I have. And so that's really the telltale. It's not about how far you are on the right side of the athletic spectrum or all those things are cool. And those athletic guys make me look better as a coach, but really what it comes down to is consistency. And you've just been insanely consistent for yeah. the last two years. Like, I love it. I enjoy yeah. doing it. I think I've only missed a few workouts and because I was like Very super few. sick. Yep. Super right. sick. Or, and then if I have vacation, I always tell you like, I'm going to be gone. Let's plan for a deload. Yep. We plan deload weeks. And so so we got your body weight up to almost 230. Right. And in the process, you know, we've talked about this both uh, on the podcast we've done that I've done with you and also in some of the articles that we've written. Anytime you're gaining weight, anytime you're gaining both muscle and fat. Right. right. And so what we're trying to do is you gain is you're trying to gain mostly muscle and the least amount of fat possible. But you're obviously gaining some fat. And so at 230, when you were up around 230, you were a little bit uncomfortable with the I got pudgy. Like my waist pudge. got up to like 39 inches, yeah, so which was the horror. Right. <laughs> but I mean, well, from what though? Uh, th from, from 36? Uh, it was like 34. I mean, like yeah. I was kind of at 34 when I started mm -hmm. and then I ramped it up to 39 inches, which yeah. was pretty, and even my wife was like, you're looking, you're not looking good. She's yeah. like, you're not, you're looking unhealthy. This is the prop, the hard part with the, the program often. And, and certainly some of the negative feedback gets is that it will make, people fat. But the interesting thing is, is that you just have to get through that window right. of strength gains. And while it's there for the taking, you've got to take it. You've got to swing yep. for the fences. And so you did, you swung for the fences. We got you big. We got you strong. You crushed your 500 pound deadlift PR. You squatted over 400 pounds, right? You're, you're benching over 300 pounds. Now you're pressing over 200 pounds. And then over the last several months, maybe the last, what, about three to four months, somewhere in there. Yeah we've really tweaked your macros and started pulling back and you have lost about 15 pounds. Now you're about 215 ish. 214. Yeah, so it's so you tweak the macros. That's the macronutrients. The it's macro. Like, yeah. You know, so like micronutrients would be like calcium, potassium, yeah, the or, macros, the yeah, macros, the macros macronutrients, right? So what we did was we, uh, the protein is always going to be high and really kind of depends on the person. But for the most part, we recognize that Brett tended to respond better to a little higher carbs and yeah. less fat. It I, responds well. No, actually I got my genome sequence. Cause like we, we put me on the fat, the high fat thing, mm -hmm, right? Cause everyone's right. like, you got to do high fat. That's like the paleo, all that stuff. Like, yeah, of course. Look at this guy. He lost lots of body fat by eating lots of fat. And I would do that and I would just get fat. Right. And I would feel like crap. Yep. And they're like, no, you just got to push through, right? There's that, that thing. You're going to feel like crap. You're going to feel like you have the flu. And I would do that. And then I would just still feel like crap and I would get fatter. <laughs> And then I would move to, okay, let's just go to higher carbs. Yep. You know, that's the same voice Thrall uses for internet haters. Yeah, Did right. you know it? Yeah. Like, right. oh, right. God, Thrall. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and what happened was I felt great yep. and the body fat started coming yep. off. Yep. Um, and so, I mean, that's a good, that's a good point there. I feel like when it, especially with nutrition advice and even fitness advice, everyone's different. Sure. Right. Just because you see some guy who's promoting paleo, like it works for him. Sure. Just because it works for him 
doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Absolutely. Right? And just because high carb works for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Sure. So that's what's been great about you is like, we'll experiment. Yeah. And we'll say, let's try this. Take some time to figure out how to get it tweaked to the point that we can really dial it in. Right. And now we've got to dial it in. And it's also why it's important that when you hire a coach, those the <laughs> listeners out there to hire a coach, that you stick with them long enough to let them figure it out. And, you know, occasionally we get somebody that will jump from this coach to this. They'll hire this coach and that coach. Well, the problem is, I don't care what the coach says. Your very first program from that coach, especially if you're not an absolute novice, it's just a cookie cutter program because they don't know you yet. So now like you're programming now, you're doing advanced programming, but I actually write that programming every week for you because it has to be so tailored to you because I've now figured out exactly what works with you. But that it took a while to get there. Well. And it was the same thing with the diet. And so now you're 214, you're as strong as you've ever been in your life. And you're lean and you look good yeah. and your waist, waist, waist is down to 33 and a half inches. Yeah, so the waist is real. now smaller than it was when he started. Right, right. But think about this, like his erectors are bigger. Right. His abdominal wall is bigger. His obliques are bigger. And so the amount of fat that's come off of his midsection is tremendous. So he's now smaller waist than he was when he started, you know, 30 pounds less than this. And got him up to 30, dropped him back down to 214. And I you look good, yeah. healthy, look really good. What's yeah. mama say now? She looks, yeah, look, look great. You know, she looks, you look strong. You look yeah. healthy, right? But again, there's that, yeah, I think a lot of people need to understand that you're going to go through that period where you're just going to feel like you're going to look like crap. Yep. Well, um, wait a minute. You, you don't look like crap. I don't know. You I looked like crap. I look hack. My wife said I looked haggard and I just looked, <laughs> You look like a big, strong dude. I, I, I saw don't know. you. I was kind of, I, I, I you remember I did, I did a video and I, there was a gut, like you could see well, the gut <laughs> and it was just like hanging out there. Because I did a video, like, what happened to Art of Manliness videos? So I stopped doing yeah, yeah. them. And I saw I've been powerlifting. And then people were like, dude, you got a gut. Right. And I was like, yeah, it's true. I do have a gut. Yeah. Um, that's gone. Yeah, now. we got to start to YouTube. We need to do a new video. We do at least one more video. But again, but like, you have to trust the process. Yeah. I think it's hard for a lot of people. And I feel like I'm a pretty coachable person. Definitely. And I think that's come yeah. from, you know, playing sports in high school. And being able to take feedback like that to get better. So if you've never been coached, you've never played sports, that might be hard, yep. right, to take that sort of feedback. We just did a couple of episodes about how to get started with linear progression. And we talked about, you know, you need this kind of equipment and this is what your first session looks like. And then we broke and uh, we went and ate lunch and we were saying, you know, we need to do an episode about coachability. Right. You really have to be coachable. You know, even if you just train with your buddies, like you need to listen to those guys. When you're under the bar, you don't know. Right, exactly. You, you lose your mind. You're just a hamster when you're under the bar. You've got to listen to the guy. And then if you pay somebody that has a proven track record and you don't listen, that's like, that's almost the definition of insanity. But yeah. you are so coachable. That's why you're yeah. successful. You know, if you don't miss and you listen to the expert, you just, you're going to get a very predictable outcome. The only thing that's in question is like, how long is it going to take? Right. You know, how long is it going to take to get super strong with a 33 inch waist? I think another aspect that helps you be coachable is I've tried to do this is like, I, you know, I watch my own videos and I try to like, look at, okay, what am I doing wrong? And I'll even tell Matt, like, this is what I think is what I'm doing wrong. Yep. Yeah, is correct. that right? And then I would be like, well, let me go over to Scott's house yeah. and like have him look at this in real sure, time. Sure. So I, th I think you have to take a proactive approach, like take the approach. Like I'm probably sucking at this more than I think I am. Right. With that in mind, let me do what I can to get better. Yep. Right. So that's kind of been my approach. Like, that's good. Yeah. And if somebody has an, an advice for you, that doesn't mean you're a fool. It's no, right. it's no slight, you know, there, we don't need to have ego in it when we go for help, you know? Right. And it might not, you might not even take the advice, right? Cause they might like, okay. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, Reynolds told me you need to gain some weight. Right. I think I was like 185. I think when I started with you or something like that, maybe 190, you know, like, you yeah. need to gain some weight. So I got up around 220. It's like, you know, I think you'd do really great at 260. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that? Yes. And uh, I said, uh, no, no, <laughs> right. I'd have to get a new car. Like, right. I, drive a Honda. Like, I, I wouldn't fit in the car anymore. It's, so, you know, I but just it's, use my judgment, but it's good. Yeah. It's use your own judgment, but get that third eye on you because you yeah. might not be seeing something that you don't know about. We do the same thing all the time. The staff will post videos of ourselves to the rest of the staff and say, Hey, what does this look like? What am I doing wrong? You know, I had a coach that I coach who was, who was getting forward on his toes and I couldn't get him off his toes. I couldn't get him off his toes. And so I reached back, reached out to the staff and said, how do I get this guy off his toes? I've tried this. I've tried, we've tried this sitting back, we've tried the, the box squat, and, so, squat. Yeah, on the squat. And we switched him to tempo squats and three second negative eccentric and a three second concentric. And it almost instantly, the amount of time that he had to think about it, he yeah. actively thought the whole time, stay on midfoot, stay on midfoot, stay on midfoot. It cleaned it up. And I've used tempo squats before, but I've never used tempo squats to get people off their toes. And so 
it was a thing that we learned. Essentially doing temple squat is what finally got me to keep my chest up properly. Right. Yeah. It gives you time to think. The first thing I do with the vast majority of people that come see me for in person is I slow them down. Slow down. Yeah. They go too fast. I get it. They see the really good lifters as your form and that motor pattern locks in and it's perfect. It can speed up and get a little more rebound, a little more rebound, a little more rebound. The problem is, is that most people walk in and they try to get all that rebound and the form is a disaster. Yeah. And so I've got to slow it way down, do the same thing. Seminars, slow them way down. I go down really slow, up fast and you're you know, fine. Yeah. So we started, when you first hired me, we were walking in with this bicep tendonitis problem. Right. So did we fix it? We did fix it. How? So what, what it was, it was my setup on, my, on the squat. Yeah. So what was happening was the way I was setting up on the squat was to get, I was basically trying to get in a low bar position using a high bar. So I would get under the bar, like a high bar squat. Right. And wrist then, bent, elbows wrist bent, all jacked and up. And then just yeah. shove it down my right. shoulders. Mm -hmm. And then I would kind of crank up yep. my wrist above the bar. Is it here? Yeah, it was right, right there ah, that one. on both sides. Yep. And I showed you the video of how I set up and you're like, okay, next time just put your wrist on top and then just put yourself in there. Yep. And you know, it was uncomfortable. Sure. It's like, I'm really tight in my shoulders and my chest. But after doing that, it cleared it up because yes. I was no longer doing the cranking thing. Sure. And then also I think by doing, um, you know, going under and then trying to get up, I don't think I got my wrist all the way on top of the bar. Sure, right. And so I was holding a lot of that weight because what would happen, the, hands anyway. the, the bicep tendonitis would hit around like when I, my squat got up to about 325, 340. Before that, it was fine. And I think it's because, you know, I can handle 225 in my hands. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But after that, it cleared it up. I mean, that's not to say I don't get bicep tendonitis anymore. Every sure. now and then it flares up for whatever reason. But that's one thing that you have to learn as a novice lifter or an immediate lifter, like managing the pain and working around the pain. So yep. that's one of the useful things is having to coach, right? You tell me like my biceps are killing me. I don't know if I can work. And you're just like, well, ice it, take some Advil, put some, what is it? DMOS? DMSO. DMSO. DMOS yeah. with DOM. What is that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. There's DOMS. And DOMS. And there's DM. We're talking about diamond. You can treat, sulf oxide. You can right. treat DOMS with DMSO. Right. Yeah. There you go. And then you just put it on there and then, you know, you'll feel a little bit better. It's still good, but you can still do your workout. Still train. You can still train. That's the thing. And that's always, the thing. That's and that, the difference between training and exercise. And that's the thing, hard thing for a lot of inner like beginner lifters to realize, like, even if you don't feel good, even if you hurt, like you still have to train. Yep. You might adjust things a little bit, but you still have to train. Yeah, absolutely. We do it all the time. We, had, we got an email yesterday. We had a, a guy that's a, a relatively new client and he emailed because he'd strained a bicep and he said, I'm going to, I'm going to take a month off. I need you to freeze my account, take a month <laughs> off and not train. I said, well, you can't squat. You can't deadlift with a strained bicep. Like, and we'll work around the other stuff, right? Like you can probably press with a strained bicep. Right. Like, you know, you can't chin with a strained bicep, right? And you, you know, and you might not be able to bench press, but so we see this all the time. I mean, we've talked about this. Like, what injuries do you have to have to absolutely stop training? It's very few. Fever, broken bones, muscle avulsions. Yeah. Yeah, and even, a, like, a broken bone in the last 24 hours, sort of broken bone, right? Like, right. If, I, if I have a broken arm, I'm not going to train for a day or two, but then, and I'm not going to press and bench press, but I'm going to figure out how to squat with a safety squat bar. Right. And I'm going to figure out how to one-arm sumo deadlift, because, which isn't optimal, but it's better than sitting at home and dying. You know, which is the problem. Yeah, I've got a guy with a broken leg that I've got him doing like the seated deadlifts. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it sucks. But what's he going to do? Like what are you he gonna broke do? his femur, right? you know? Right. But I think that's where a coach comes in handy. So I think course. if someone was doing it on their own, they'd be like, well, yeah, I can't. What do I do? I, what do I, I'm hurt. Sure. I just got to get But like, a coach would be like, no, you're fine. You're not going to die. Rub some dirt on it, boy. Right. Like, you're going to be okay. Sure. And it's good to have that someone just to push you like that. So... That's another thing. So uh, we did intermediate thing. What would you call it? What I was doing like a split. Four day, yeah, four day split. Four day split. Like, and then after that, what what was it? You like had DUP? Is that what DUP? we did? Yeah, yeah, I think it was DUP and that was terrible. Yeah. That but you sucked. got real strong. That sucked. Yeah, no, I got strong. But that was another thing. It was weird. <laughs> you didn't block now? What am I doing now? Yeah, you know, block. Yeah. Yeah. This version of block. I don't even know. I don't even ask. But the DUP, what I thought was interesting was, and this is where, again, like that, where you have to trust the process, trust the coach was with the deadlifts, there were some days where it was just like, it was really heavy and you're having me do a lot of reps. Yep. Yeah. And I was like, I can't do this. Like yep. I can do one rep or two reps. And you're just like, I have to do five of them and then like mm. two sets of it. Two sets. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and you're like, no, it's okay. You know, you're not going to get it, but you're eventually going to get it. And I was like, I don't think so. And then, but I'll be darned. Like yep. three weeks later, I was hitting, get it. I was getting it. So that was weird. I mean, and then, sure. and, but then I was glad when we were done. Uh, with DUP. 
the, the first time anybody goes into advanced programming where they've come out of this idea that like the fatigue process, right? The stress recovery adaptation, that stress, the time that it takes me to go through that entire stress recovery adaptation process goes from every day to weekly. And then you get into this thing where all of a sudden I'm trying to drive up your fatigue for four, five, six weeks in a mm -hmm. row and then dissipate it so that we get enough stress to break homeostasis enough and then allow you to recover to get the needed adaptation, which becomes harder and harder and harder as you become more advanced, right? You can't, at this point, you can't deadlift 535 on Saturday and then do 540 on Monday and then 545 on Wednesday. It's like not possible. Yeah. So this entire stress recovery adaptation cycle elongates. And the first time somebody's exposed to that where they've never really had to go through several weeks of fatigue buildup, it crushes them. It sucks. I mean, it's it's more psychologically. Oh, for sure. Not the. Like, it's, I mean, you're tired, but like the psychology, you feel like I should be able to do this. Like I feel fine physically, but then you get down there and you're just like, no, it's not happening. And you it happens like workout after workout yeah, after you, workout. You go into the training session already tired. Right. And and it beats you down. And I, I remember there's a few moments like I'm you know I'd write my reports to you and be like, dude, this is just really depressing. Like right. this is like my fourth workout where I didn't get all the lifts and this sucks. And you'd be like. Okay, well, that's when you you do things like, oh, let's take a look at your diet and let's tweak that a bit. But yeah, but it's it's so weird. Like the next week, everything's awesome. Yep. And you, I don't, it's just, it's weird. It's yep. the weirdest thing. So what was your bachelor's in, bachelor degree? Uh, letters yeah. at the University like, of Oklahoma. So like it's basically- classic. Yeah, so it's, a, it's just a fancy way of saying humanities degrees. Actually, letters is the very first degree that like medieval universities gave yeah. out nice. back in the day. So it was connected with the classics department. So I had to take Latin, I had to take a modern language, I had to study philosophy, literature, history, yeah, all that good stuff. So we're in a book club, actually all three of us do, right. do that. We read kind of the ancient great texts of- The great West, books. The great books, books of yeah, Western books. civilization. Intellectual linear progression. That's right. We do intellectual linear progression. I, I wanted to ask you, what has occurred in your own life in the refining process of barbell training and can you compare that to what you've seen in this intellectual linear progression as well, having gone through that even as even as a young man, right? So even at the time that you were in your bachelor, I assume 19, 20, 21 years old, what does this look like for you? If we pull away from the physical side, what right. has the barbell training done for you mentally, emotionally, socially? And then how does that how does that look in that kind of big picture of this linear? Right. So emotionally barbell training can become addictive uh in a way because like you chase numbers and that's it's kind of scary that i'm like okay i thought always like 500 that's it no, i'm six. done i'll quit yeah no okay now 600 now yeah right. uh, i'm going for 600 yeah and it's like this is safe um but yeah. no <laughs> that going back to that we talked we were talking about some stoicism last night right mm. the way you master fate is just to accept the burden of fate right and uh barbell training is a lot like that there's some day you just go in and you know it's going to be hard but you still do it. Yeah. The idea of like, you know, success in life is just showing up. Uh, and that's the same with barbell training. Like you just, you get down there and do the work. It's going to be the, it might be the crappiest workout. You might not even get your lifts, but you show up because you create that habit. So the next time you go in there and you've created that habit, you'll go in there the next time you do better. So I think, I mean, that that was to say that the big picture thing, that's what I love about barbell training is that if you just show up in life, if you accept that things are going to be hard, you can get through it. And I mean, it also shows you that what the human psyche or the human, what a human being is capable of pushing themselves through. We often think we're very fragile. Mm -hmm. um, and we, in a lot of ways we are, right? But it's amazing how fast we can recover from things. You know, we were talking, we were reading the Aeneid. This guy, his city burnt down. He had to carry his dad on his shoulders. His wife died. But this guy was able to push on. He was able to sol soldier on. I'm sure you guys have seen people in your own lives where, just tragedy strikes and you think, man, how can anyone recover from that? Yep. But they do. Yep. They do. I mean, that's, that, and I think that's, uh, should give people a lot of hope. No matter where you are, if you had some terrible thing that happened in your life and you think it's just going to devastate you, uh, it's going to suck. It's going to hurt for a while. But I think there's that whole stress adaptation recovery thing that happens yep. to us psychologically too. Like you're going to become stronger yeah. in the process and you're going to look back and it, you know, it still might hurt when you think about it, but you'll be stronger True. right? and you can, you can push yourself further than you thought. So maybe that's another thing you can learn from barbell training. Yeah. I think the barbell training prepares you better for those times in life than for those who haven't done it. Right. So 
Um, I certainly don't want to call tragedy on my my life, but I do feel like I'm better prepared to handle it if I have to, if I am called to do that because of the barbell training that I've done. There was a thread on Reddit last week, big earthquakes in Mexico yep. last week. And a guy said, you know, the, I think the title of the thread was, this is why we train. And there were these earthquakes and the guy lived kind of in the country and like four in the morning, they jump in the truck and drive into town. And the guy spent all day like carrying cases of water and dragging people out of wrecks, you know? And he's like, you know, my deadlift's up in the mid fours for sets now. And, you know, I was able to, you know, work for 18 hours doing heavy, heavy work, you know, saving people. Yeah. And this is why we train. When I had TV, I mean, I still have a TV. I don't have cable or anything, but sure. you know, you watch uh, The Biggest Loser. Yeah. And you see these people who've never exercised ever, and they're doing the most simplest thing. And they'd just be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. This is a terrible. Like, it wasn't like physiological. Like, they were there physiologically. They, like, the psychology, yes. it wasn't right. there. Right. Because um, they had no clue that they, their body, they could push themselves further than, than, you know, getting off the couch to go get more food or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Barbell training. They just mean to move their food farther and farther right, away. Right, farther and farther away. <laughs> linear progress. Linear yeah. progress. Yeah. But no, what barbell training does, or I think exercise in general, is like you get comfortable with being uncomfortable, yep. right? When you have 400 pounds on your shoulders and you're like, this is going to suck. Oh, man. And I feel like I'm going to die. But you're, you know you're not going to die, right? Um, you can do it. And if you, know, if you can't get the squat, there's safety pins there. Um, but yeah, like when we did that session a while back ago where I did, I think, 375 for a set of four, which was like a rep PR for me. Yep. That fourth rep, I literally thought I was going to die. Like, right. this is the most terrible Lights thing <laughs> in the world. I mean, as soon as I was done, I just laid down. Yep. But like that mental conditioning, I mean, gets you ready for the other things. You realize, yeah, this is this is terrible right now, yep. but everything's, I'm not going to die. Everything yep. is going to be okay. I, I, I want to talk about you turning the TV off. When, how long have you guys been without television? Without cable. Like we have, a, so we have a TV. We just don't have yep. cable. Uh, it's been probably two years. Yeah. So, because I mean, you realize you're paying what, $150, $170, and you're to, like, to I watch, poisoned. I watch one channel, I watch one TV show. So, I was like, why don't I just get Roku and just That's buy all we it? Do. So, yeah, it's like we watch, uh, the only TV we watch is American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> okay. So, we, 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 our family loves American Ninja Warrior. When we did Downton Abbey last yeah. year, watched through that. And that, that's it. Like I, I started watching uh, Man in the High Castle. I didn't, I mean, it was okay. I didn't get into it where I wanted We're to keep going. We got about five, six episodes. Yeah. In. I like, mm. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. It wasn't, it isn't as arresting as Downton Abbey. You always <laughs> want to know what happened to the, that's, Lord Grant. Yeah, we watched it too. I watched every I episode I of watch, Downton. I don't watch anything. Reynolds is like, have you seen? Oh, never mind. Don't worry about it. No. Yeah, I've never seen it. I start anything. to ask him. The last movie I saw in a theater was the SpongeBob movie. Like ten years that's ago, that's terrible. Last movie I saw. It's one of my kids. It's like sacrifice. Yeah, for you got to do the kids. Probably stuff. lost more brain cells than had you. I love SpongeBob. But what I am doing, I bought an old school TV antenna. I'm going to put it up because you, you see, if you have cable connections all through your house, you can connect an antenna, put it on your house, and then use that cable connection to you know give TV to all your HD TVs in your house. Because I want to do that. Because like I want to watch a football game every now and then sure. on Saturday. I can't do that right now right. with the Roku. So that makes sense. So I'm going to do, we watch TV like 1955 here. That's a lot of our TV time has been replaced under barbell. Like yeah. We train in the evening, you know, and, yep. uh, you know, we train in the, in the garage and we can see the houses across the street. They've all got the light in the window, you know, cause they're all watching TV and we're out there sweating and grunting. Yeah. I, I used to be the biggest superior. sports fan, huge sports fan. I, mean, I, I was one of these kids that would read the sports almanac growing up and, and memorize the stats and, and play, yeah. And played, uh, you know, fantasy, everything, fantasy football, yeah, fantasy I never baseball. Fantasy fantasy yeah. It was more, it was more about bragging rights with your buddies and stuff. But since the business has grown and two, since I think I grew up <laughs> at some point and realized that my time was more valuable than that. I don't think that sports are immoral or anything. I think they're amoral. Obviously they're not necessarily good or bad. And then there's pieces of sports that I actually really like. But for me, it was one of those deals where I was busy enough that, I was going to train for sure. And I trained with my wife and it's something that my wife and I are able to do together. And then I'm going to have free time in the evenings with my family. If I'm watching sports, I've got two little girls, a wife, and two little girls. They don't want to watch sports. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up, I'm, you know, we don't, and we're the same way. We actually have access to cable TV, but it's only because our internet comes from the same company and it doesn't save us any money to not have cable TV. So I'm basically paying the same I price for internet extra to not, to not have, have it. Yeah, yeah, I know it's, it's actually something to think about to just have them yank it anyway. Yeah. Anyway, it's good. So last piece of this is it's good. So what uh, last piece of this is what do you think draws some of us to this idea of voluntary hardship? Like, why were you drawn to that both in like intellectually and physically? He loves that shit. I know. No, I'm, it's good, I'm a man. masochist. I don't know. <laughs> it's more than that. 
I don't know. It's just, I think it's the way I was raised, my family background, just playing sports and football and where you're inculcated in that, like you do hard things because they make you better. Yeah. That's where I think it comes from. I mean, it's just the way I grew up and that's what I like. But the funny thing is there's a lot of people I, I grew up, they did the same thing I did, but they're not really doing that anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what the difference is. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the difference maker is. You just got, I mean, at a certain point, you know, it's up to the person. Yeah. Right? You can do everything Yeah, it sucks though because I think about it all the time with my own kids. I think about it with the guys that I mentor, the guys in their 20s, and you go like, how do I get these guys to buy? How do I get my own kids to buy into? Like we model this extremely well. It's hard. Um, I think I think we overestimate, like especially with parenting, like how much influence parenting can have. I, I think because yeah, it makes us right. think it makes us feel like we're in control, but we're not. Right. I mean, I've seen families where the parents did the exact same thing. One kid turned out sure. fantastic. The other one was just okay. Failure to launch. Predestination. And, <laughs> That's fate, right. Fate. But like, I mean, it, whatever it could have been. I mean, because there's so many factors in there. There's their genetics, there's their friends they hung out with, there's the timing of when they were born and the kind of the culture milieu they were surrounded in. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think parents need to cut themselves some slack. <laughs> you know, you realize, okay, you can do the best you can and it might not turn out the way you hope it would turn out. But like, what do you do? I mean, the only thing you do is just show by example. Sure. And well, that's really what you've done with the website, with Art of Manliness and, and with the, the new launch of The Strenuous Life that you, I, I guess... Do you think that you're reaching guys now who are already committed to voluntary hardship and then you're giving them a pathway to continue down that road? Or do you think you're actually converting some people who were not yeah, wired for voluntary good, hardship? That's a hard question. But with The Strenuous Life, I think it's mainly guys who have been looking for it. Yeah. What we're trying to do with The Strenuous Life, so for people who don't know what it is, we started this thing called The Strenuous Life. It's basically Boy Scouts for Men. have created badges fifty based around 50 different skills. They have to do an hour of physical activity every day. I don't care what it is. It could be yoga for all I care. I just want sure. people to move mm -hmm. their bodies. Mm -hmm. Just for the badge. Just mm -hmm. There's a barbell badge. There's too. a barbell badge too. Yep. But no, there's an hour of physical activity and then like a good deed every day. I mean, you have to check in every day, make sure you did these things. And it's been amazing the feedback we've been getting. It's like, guys, I'm saying, I've been looking for this. Mm -hmm. I've been wanting to push myself, but I don't have a structure. Yeah, no accountability. I have no accountability. Yeah. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to get started. I mean, that's why I loved Boy Scouts as a kid. Yeah, is you just go in and like, oh, here's the stuff you do, and yeah. you do this stuff. You're gonna learn some things, and you're gonna be better. And so that's what we're doing with the strenuous life. So I think we are attracting guys who are like this is what they had an itch they wanted to scratch. There's a lot of uh, former military guys who are signing up who are like, I miss this sort of sure. thing. So am I, am I getting people who are just like super lazy? Probably not. Yeah. Maybe the art of, hopefully, you know, we do an art of man list. We'll, you know, convince them otherwise. But, uh, I think when I, I think the goal there is you, with that stuff, you can't, you can't preach it. I think men don't respond to preaching mm. where you just like get on a, you know, yeah, pulpit. A preaching Adam for sure. You know, yeah. You know, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. This is what you need to do. Like maybe some guys do. Sure. Where you just like, they do all the, they say all the trite things like push yourself by like. Even as a, as a, as a football player, when my, when my coaches did that, I was like, okay, I, that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't inspirational quotes. Doesn't do it. Not no, so much. doesn't do yeah. it for me. No. Yeah. I remember like, yeah, the thing where my football coach would say, be like, this is like so hard that normal people can't do this. And you guys are going to be so much more successful because you played football. And I was like, I don't think that's necessary. Cause I know <laughs> right. a lot of guys here that <laughs> probably aren't going to be that successful. I know a lot of guys who played football. Right. Yeah that were successes. They're still talking only about the days they used to play football. Right. 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 That's the, that was the highlight of their life. Right. Exactly. I love what you do because for a lot of reasons, but one of the things is they're, I don't know, people are becoming more sort of, um, I don't know, in siloed. Right. You know, and you know, there used to be lots of fraternal organizations and lots of outlets for men to be men among each other and help each other. And, and those things don't exist anymore or they're marginalized and they existed for a reason. And right. now, now people don't pay any heed to those older organizations. And, uh, there's a big void there to be filled and you, you help do that. You reach these people through a medium that they can relate to and kind of feel that need. It's a big deal. Yeah. And that's what I'm hoping the strenuous life does. Cause one of the things we're hoping it does is it gets people together in actual meat space, like, you know, get together. It's like, we're going to do a thing tomorrow. Yeah. Right. And there's, I think how many, five or six guys who are coming, a few more, yeah. a few more who are going to, we're going to do some deadlift and yeah. then we're going to go to ruck. Deadlift, ruck. Cause I think that's important. Like, especially for men men in their thirties and forties are some of the loneliest people in the world yeah, and loneliness, like it hurts not only psychologically, but physically. And it's, I think yeah. part of one of the reasons why you're seeing this opioid thing that's happening in a lot of these, in a lot of, and in a lot of Americas, people are just lonely. Mm -hmm. They're sad. Yeah. 
and there's no outlet for that anymore. Yeah. They don't have a place where they can go. So I'm hoping that, you know, the strenuous life can provide, you know, it's not going to solve it obviously, but it's going to help in that area. Yeah. And provide the framework for guys to get together and, and actually do stuff that's valuable together. Right. right. So as it's not just to, watching sports, right. watching well, USC fight, there's nothing that, wrong with that. It's something that recognizes there's a call to something greater here. And we can actually refine ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, all these things right. where, where we're missing out because we, because we're often, most of us are stuck in kind of suburb hell. Right. right, where our life is going to soccer practice all the time. To right. take, you pull you know, the car in the garage, put the door down, then get out. And but go that's exactly right. Yeah. Nobody sits on the front porch. Nobody knows their neighbors anymore, right? right. So air conditioning, central air conditioning gets invented, and all of a sudden yep. there's no eaves overhanging eaves. Nobody's out on the front porch or back porch anymore. It's the You know, our friend Mel Rippey, he went to one of our training days that we had here in Tulsa, and we had like 40 people show up to, to train together. We weren't, weren't in a clinic or anything. We just through a weightlifting party, essentially. And uh, he called me and he's like, I can't believe how n supportive everybody was. Now everybody was like, he, he brought his, he brought his 14, 15 year old son. And everybody was just cheering his son on, you know, the, uh, there's a guy there that actually he, he was just trained at this gym and he came over to me and he said, what's that kid's name? And I said, well, that's, you know, that's a, that's Jacob. And so when Jacob went up to deadlift, that guy was just yelling for him, you know, yeah. and um, right. I was like, I, you know, I wish I had that kind of community all the, all the time. I'm like, well, why don't you come and try it? Right. You know, sure. But yeah, people are dying for that. People, and here's the thing. It's like, it's so weird. It's like, we've forgotten how to socialize. Yep. Right. Particularly, I think, you know, 20 somethings, 30 somethings. So you, you look back at your parents. I remember my parents, their generation, our grandparents generation, like they would just get together just randomly. Yeah. Let's play bridge. Play yeah. bridge. Bring Let's, a casserole. Bring a cat. Like it's yeah. keep it low key. And I think I feel like millennials, particularly, they have to have like high expectations of how things mm. should be. It's like it needs to be like awesome because it's gonna be on Instagram. Sure. It's gonna be on Pinterest. So they have to like make it like cute. Right. And they have to like it's all this work. So it's so much work that like I'm not even gonna do this. Yep. When it's just like, you know, just invite some people over to your house, order a pizza. Yeah. Train take bar the phone. You know, yeah, take the phone. Put it, flip, put it flip face away. down. That's right. And I think also too, we tend to outsource our socialization or the organization of socializing to companies, right? It's like, I'm going to let this company figure out what we're going to do. Mm. So say, with, say more about that. Like who would that yeah. be? These events that, that like the mud runs and like, oh, sure. it's like, it's super elaborate conferences. Like, yep. I mean, that's how people socialize. Like I'm going right. to go to a conference where I pay money. It's like, you don't need to, to do socialize. that. To socialize. You don't need to do yeah. that. You can actually just call your neighbor over. Yeah. And you know, crack open a six pack and right. whatever. That's your thing. When, yeah. when Terry and I first got married, there was a couple in their like eighties that lived on the corner from us. And every Friday there would be cars out there. And we were taking a walk one day and I I could see in the window they were playing cards. The next Monday evening, I went and banged on the door and I knock, knock, you know, you guys know how to play bridge? And I'm like, Yeah, we have a bridge game every Friday. And so we played bridge with them every Wednesday for years. Yeah. And people used to do that all the time you think it's gonna be boring but it's actually pretty fun no, it's great. You, you play it for like the conversation yeah. yeah you just get there and you just talk and jibber jabber and that's why i like barbell training i think if you have a gym in your garage like that's such a op great opportunity to get some people over just like hey want a deadlift and i think most yeah. if you ask most guys that right they're gonna like jump at the chance to do that sure. so we did that uh, i'm like the the leader of the men's group in my church and i need to do an activity because like, they don't really do anything so I was like, let's just uh, do donut deadlifts and donuts. So I bought, you know, two dozen donuts and we had like eight or nine guys show up, which That's is not more than donuts. It's not enough donuts. <laughs> right. Wouldn't be but, for us. Cause like I was just deadlift. Like they were excited to like, Oh, yeah. I'm going to get to deadlift. Yeah. Um, do something hard. Do something hard. So it doesn't have, I mean, I would encourage you if you all are listening to this. That's what I love about most of the people who are into strength community get that. Yep. I mean, I love, one of the things I love going to the meet it's just like everyone's just super cool and down yeah. to earth. The strength community is not what you see in the online community. Right. The trolls there are much louder than everybody else. If you actually go where strength people are, they're the kindest people you'll ever meet. Because no, yeah. the stronger they are, the more they've gotten their butt kicked and the more they understand what you're doing. And they're just the nicest people. Right. They really are. I think the primary target is just like everyone needs to be strong. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's about strength and health and the refinement that occurs there before aesthetics, right? And aesthetics comes. I mean, we see it with Brett, right? So, so I, I do see it. Oh, so, right. Okay, thank you. I could, listen, we met last, was it last week we met for lunch? Yeah. And you got out of the car and I was like, 
Oh my god! Look at that guy. He's like jacked. And You're lean. making me blush. No, it's, yeah, it's you were like, in your strenuous life. I was wearing my shorty shorts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the it's, shorty shorts. No, it's good. So aesthetics certainly is part of that. It's a byproduct of this performance increase. But the fitness industry is rife with all these people that all they care about is the aesthetics. Yeah. And so then, and most people don't know any better, right? That that is what fitness is to them. And so still, there's probably an enormous percentage of your listeners, of your readers, of your website, of kind of like. Wait, what are they doing? Like, I thought they don't look like a men's health model, like the guy that's on the cover of the magazine. Like, well, you don't understand. That guy didn't eat any food or drink any water yeah. for four days they and took that. diuretics and, yeah. and tanned and everything just for the photo shoot. He's super not healthy for that photo shoot, just so he can look what you think is healthy. They oiled that guy down. At first, he took a bunch of diuretics right. and all that stuff, and then they oiled him down. They took those photos. He collapsed. They started an IV. Yeah, right. 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 For real. Yeah. Like, like I, I, I was talking to a guy, he called me when I do training and he, and he said, you know, the Brad Pitt shirtless fight club scene, you know, right. that's it. I'm like, no, it's listen, not going to happen. Look, no. <laughs> Brad Pitt's, I think he's six foot tall. I looked it up. I think he was six foot tall and he probably weighed, Missouri native, by the yeah. way. He weighed about 165. Bit, yeah. day? He probably weighed 165 in that. Yep. And of course he, he read the script. They signed the contract. He knew he was going to shoot the film eight months out. Sure. Right. So they start working. And get paid $18 million. $18 million. So he can sacrifice a little bit of health because he's going to get paid. Of course. So he starts training for this. And then he knows, okay, Friday we're shooting that scene. Yeah. So he's taking every drug. He's drinking horse pee. Like, right. right. And right. Then, he, then he takes all the diuretics. You know, he sweats. He, you know, he sits in the sauna. He does all that stuff. They shoot that scene. They start the he IV. He collapses. He collapses. Yeah. They start an IV because he's dehydrated. And then all the guys watching the movie and go, I want to look just like that guy. Right. Look how well he performed right. in the fight in the basement of Fight Club on that scene. Right. In that movie. Like, yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, and then and then meanwhile you got, you know, nineteen year old guy, he weighs two thirty one, you know, he he squats one fifteen. It's like, man, we just want to help you get better. Like, you know, let's not worry about Pitt. Right. Yeah. Just, can we help you get better? Like yeah. And also what I like about it just start is where you I feel like a lot of guys, the reason they don't even get into physical fitness at all is they think it takes too much time. Sure. Like whenever I post like PRs, they're like I would love to do that, but I don't have any time. Like I don't yeah. have, I can't train every day. And I'm like, dude, I train three, maybe four times a week yeah. and it's 45 minutes. Yeah. You need three hours a week. Right. Give me and, three hours a week. Cause like, that's all it takes yep. and you don't have to make your whole life around it nope. and you can have a family yep. and still do it and yep. still get strong. Yeah. I mean like I, three times a week, it's all I train. Yep. I mean, I guess I'm doing four times a week now. Yeah. But you're also advanced. Right. But when you first start out that much time. Right. But it's still not that much. 45 minutes tops. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and if you're not watching TV, if you're not, you got plenty of time. Yeah, right. Really, yeah. plenty of time. Get, right. What, what's the average person watch TV? It's week? something. It's still something crazy, even though it's twenty hours a week. Yeah, it. it's still oh, something it insane. That's yeah, crazy. Like we just added computers to that. Right. I was reading some study about that. It's pretty yeah. nuts. Dude, thanks for being on the show. No, this is fun. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you've been a hell of a client. In spite of you, uh, you've helped us tremendously. But I'm, I'm just thankful for the fact that you've just been consistent for two straight years. You know, it's one of those awesome well, things. We well, look at the guy's bracelet. He's wearing a bracelet. This is do it now. Do it now good yeah i gotta get you one of these things so wait what's on what's next on the table for me well you've got the meats Meat coming, up. coming up so the meat's coming up the end of october for you so i like to ask you a question so you know if you go to you go to the meet you get you get a total you're going to qualify for the the nationals in uh, oakland uh, right? Jan yeah. last week of january or something like that second week of january second, right or third whatever you want to go to nationals we're t yeah we're my wife already talking about my wife because we got friends in san francisco so cool. we're tentatively planning maybe go. together are you guys gonna go i'll be there okay so if you go or if some of my clients go i'll go i'm actually flying home from hawaii oh, the day before but well but what i may do is just book the flight to san francisco since i'm coming from hawaii anyway yeah have my family go on home and I'll stop in San Francisco for an extra couple of days and then come home two days later or whatever. That's, I certainly can do that. So yeah, you, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll be cool for you at the meet is that you're going to set three PRs, three individual PRs and a total PR at a weight class lower than you did right. last time, which is cool. So the weight has finally has gone yeah. down. You're leaner, you're stronger. You've got more muscle. All those things have occurred. And because you're stronger, you can set quantifiable things. And so then after the meet, we'll do the same thing that we did last time. And we'll have the discussion and say, okay, where do you want to go now? But I think that it's time to do a powerlifting meet down the road. Like an actual powerlifting? Like, yeah, like, like an actual with a, yeah, with a bench press. So okay. and, and get a... My bench press is terrible, though. It's well, not that great. It's kid, I mean, it's, it's you've That's how you make passed 300 pounds. Yeah. So I bet you bench press 315 uh, by Thanksgiving. That'd be pretty cool, man. Because we identified where the weak point is now. Right. So, yeah. Well, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for what you've done at Art of Manliness and the Strenuous Life. It's been uh, it's been awesome. We've got such great crossover 
appeal, I think. And so I know we've got a ton of our clients that are big Art of Manliness fans, and we've had a ton of guys sign up from Art of Manliness for online coaching. And uh, it's been awesome. No, it's been fun. Thanks. Anything you need to plug? No, Art of, just go to Art of Manliness. The strenuous life to, dot co. Dot co, yeah. yeah. I got the dot com finally. The guy finally sold it to me. But, nice. But it's dot co. Squatter. I'm going with that. So, yeah, the strenuous life dot co if you want to get into Boy Scouts for Men, right? Yeah. So, That's earn awesome. some badges and There's do a barbell badge. Do hard things. Yeah, we set that up. So, well, this is Barbell Logic. I'm Scott. You can find me on Instagram. I'm at Scott underscore Silverstrength. Reynolds is at Reynolds Strong. And we'll uh, talk to you guys in a few days. Thank you. Thank you.